brought to you almost live from the dude in the basement studios. Why? Because that's where the good stuff is. It sips, suds, and smokes with your smoke and host, the good old boys. Suds, suds, suds. It's time for more suds. Well, it's not time for suds, but it's definitely time for me today on our suds episode where everything good in life is worth discussing. I am one of your hosts here today, Lay Brother Mike. Joining me also here at the table is Monk Jason. Hello, everyone. And Prior Shea. Hello. <laughs> Are all the priors that quiet? See, yes, it's <laughs> just uh, since uh, sips, sips, suds, and smokes is sponsored by Craft Beer Kings. Craft Beer Kings is the home of all your beer, wine, and mead knees, and is home of the mystery box. You can get them at www.craftbeerkings.com. Well, today we have a very special show. Welcome to the Masterpiece Mead Show, where we are going to discuss yet another episode of poor fake British accents, cheeky pan flute music, and all things mead today. Our sud segments are all about beer, beer, and today it's about mead. We decided to toss mead in this category as well. Today's episode is featuring an overview of mead and mead from bee nectar. Monk Jason gets the honors of going over our suds ratings for today. Hopefully not in a poor British accent. (laughs) Certainly not. Uh, Today we'll be discussing these meads and rating them with suds ratings plus our signature belching sounds. Here are those ratings. Number one, that sucks. Give me anything but a bud. Number two, was that a belch? I think that's the sound that somebody made the last time I did a fake British accent. Probably correct. <laughs> Number three. Ah, what a relief. That's what usually people say when I don't talk in a fake British accent. <laughs> ah, what a relief. All right. Number four. A body should really not make that sound. Uh, uh, and number five. Listen to that hang time. Give me another. Thank you very much, Monk Jason, for going over our Sud and Mead ratings for today. Today's show is a show of Masterpiece Mead. It is a Mead 101 show, plus we're going to feature Mead from one place. B Nectar is the brewery that we're going to, or a meadery that we're going to uh, be talking about today. So the Meads uh, we're going to talk about today, again, are all from B Nectar. And here they are. The first one is Anasazi, Buckwheat Sizer, and Apple Pie are the three products that we're going to talk about on this Mead 101 show today as well. Good stuff. So, Monk Jason and Prior Shea are going to cover some background material on Mead, and up first is Monk Jason. All right, so what is Mead? Mead is an alcoholic beverage created by fermenting honey and water. Uh, You can also alter or adulterate this with uh, fruit, spices, grains, hops. uh, Fake British accents. uh, Yeah. (laughs) Fake fake British accents work. And, uh, you know, the alcoholic content of mead can be fairly broad uh, from from the lower alcohol range in the 7-8% on up into into the low 20s even. Uh, So you can have some pretty potent stuff here. Um, The big question you may be asking yourself is, what is the difference between uh, mead and beer? Uh, the defining characteristic of mead is that a majority of the beverage's uh, fermentable sugar is derived from honey. Uh, it may be still, it could be carbonated or sparkling. Um, 
levels of, of sweetness vary from dry, semi-sweet to uh, almost cloyingly sweet in, in many cases. So what you're saying is they're sticky sweet. Very sticky sweet. Shane and I both agree that that is the entrance criteria for stripper auditions is they have to dance to a Def Leppard. It's the anthem. Some sugar on me. It's definitely the anthem. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. maybe they should combine me in, in the experience. That yeah. would make it more exciting, wouldn't it? I'd go. Yeah. I could see, you know, if a stripper poured meat all over her, I, I wouldn't really care what she's pouring on her. But anyway. It's an Body interesting shots thing. of mead. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Bee Nectar's uh, Tasted Room. That's what we need to go for. Oh, there we go. Finally, a destination in Michigan. <laughs> That's it. We've come up. I can hear the Michigan Visitors Bureau calling us now. You guys have cracked the code to bring people to the great state of Michigan. That's it. This is totally it. I already know what's happened. Banned once again. We have been. We've been banned already from, <laughs> from the state of Michigan. Is exactly what's happened out of that. <laughs> All right, Monk Jason, you had some more to tell us about meat and oh, sticky sure. stuff. Oh, sure, yes, very sticky stuff. Um, meat is uh, possibly one of the most ancient uh, fermented beverages out there. It's uh, sources of ancient history throughout Europe, Africa, Asia. Um, it can be regarded, like I said, as the ancestor of all fermented drinks. Uh, Claude Levi Strauss makes a case for the invention of mead as a marker of the passage from nature to culture. Mead has played an important role in the beliefs and mythology of some peoples. One such example is the mead of poetry, a mead of Norse mythology, crafted the blood of the wise wise being, oh, I can't even pronounce that one, (laughs) Visser, uh, which uh, turns the drinker into a poet or scholar. Or a stripper in the Middle Ages. (laughs) Or Michigan. You'll often hear the, ter- the terms mead and honey wine uh, used simultaneously or synonymously. Honey wine is differentiated from mead in some cultures. Hungarians hold that while mead is made of honey, water, and beer yeast, honey wine is watered honey fermented with, uh, with grapes uh, or other fruits. So Prior Shea is going to tell us all about the wide varieties of meads. All right, there are a lot of different meads. I'll go over what's uh, what's the most and what was in these markets. Um, you got Braggot. Braggot is made with hops and honey. Um, don't let uh, Jason fool you. Jason knows more about these meads than I do. So um, if you see me slip up, I, I, I don't I don't brew it. And only going by Wikipedia. So <laughs> if you want to go on Wikipedia and change these <laughs> definitions, you can. Well, braggot is also defined by having malt in it as well. So it's it's a blend of uh, of uh, beer and uh, mead. I told you. Hmm. So uh, there's also sizer, which is one of the ones we're actually going to be trying today. Uh, it's a blend of honey and apple juice. And uh, I'll refer to Jason if he needs to add on to any of my cliff notes if he wants to. <laughs> Uh, then you'll have, uh, Jason, what is it? M- Melomy? Melomel. Melomel, mm-hmm. uh, which is fruit and honey. Uh, it's a very long uh, definition. Some of it in Greek, literally. <laughs> uh, so it's essentially apple and honey uh, without getting any, um, any more in-depth than that, unless, uh, Jason, you can... Uh, well, expand that, one, that de- definition. That sure, great. sure. That one includes fruits other than apple and other than grape. Uh, so any type of your, your any, any of your berries, if you had blackberry, blueberry, um, boysenberry even, uh, anything of that nature, uh, citrus would also fall into this kind of realm as well. Um, so basically anything that wasn't uh, uh, a wine grape or apple mm. would fall into this category, into uh, the melomel category. He's so much better off script. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I, don't, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I don't think he has a script in front of him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's um, meth, meth, methligan. Methligan. Mm-hmm. That's from. Uh, I have no idea where that one's from. But um, mm-hmm. that's. 
<laughs> All right, it's nutmeg, honey, uh, ginger, uh, teas and some, vanilla. Uh, it says Welsh as uh, Welsh folk medicine. Lord knows I drink a lot of mead and still not making my health any better. <laughs> but you are trying. That's what's right. important. It's A for effort. <laughs> I was a B student. Uh, next one is uh, Pymet. Pymet is red or white wine grapes uh, and honey blends, um, also known as white mead. Jason, you got anything more on that one? No, that just covers that last category of fruit. Like we said, we had the sizer covering the apple. We had the uh, the, the melomels covering a lot of your other fruits. And then uh, finally, the Pymet covers the, the wine grapes. Huh. All right. Uh, last but not least, uh, you have uh, sack meads, which is... Most of all the ones that we're tasting today are sack meads. Uh, anything over 14% alcohol, special gravity, strength, fortified dessert wines, uh, more of like a sherry feel or sauterne or any kind of fortified dessert wine. Uh, then you have short meads, also known as quick meads. Um, maybe, Jason, do you, do you do any short or quick meads? Typically not. I've done a few, but... Um one of the characteristics of mead is is uh, unlike beer, which can be turned around in a fairly short amount of time. A lot of meads take um, a significant time to develop and mature. It's uh, a little bit of, akin to aging wine, I guess you would say. Uh, so I have turned around meads in three months. Uh, they're generally going to be your lower strength. Uh, a lot of times you need the time for those harsh alcohols that develop in the higher alcohol meads to mellow out and, and become a little more drinkable. Kind of like this pan flute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mellow out. Uh, the next, last but not least, uh, show meads. Show meads are just plain straight meads, no frills, uh, base package car model meads. So uh, these are a few that you find here in just regular markets. I will go through the other ones because I can't produ- uh, pronounce them. And there are about 40 of them, so I don't want to take about the whole entire show for just <laughs> pronouncing some of these meads. <clears throat> so, uh, quite a few different types of meads. I mean, uh, well over 30. And so, I think uh, it's, some of the common themes are basically fruits with sugar in them. Uh, th- that is kind of the running theme. So, mm-hmm. it's not even really bound by just the fruits that you guys talked about. Um, I tend to think of meads as a very local-based uh, ingredient as well. So, whatever sweet, sticky fruit is around, they're you know going to find a way to ferment something out of it. Mm-hmm. Correct. Mm-hmm. And and some of these other names that that, <clears throat> that we skipped over or descriptors, a lot of those are very, like you said, regional based. It's it's a cultural name or descriptor from a small region or country, uh, and and it there are there is a lot of overlap between mm-hmm. those styles. Well, uh, I really appreciate. Uh, you know the overview that you guys had uh, covered about the, such a wide variety of meads, and I like the the lineup that we have today. Covers these are all different, aren't they? We have uh, one that's definitely apple. Mm, definitely. Um, are the other two grape fermented grape, or do you know what they're fermented out of? No, actually, two of them include apple, oh, okay. uh, and and one does not. One of them is, I believe, straight honey, if I'm not mistaken. Huh. Well, there you go. Just wood aged. Yep. Is that the anisite? Yeah. That's yeah. about how much I knew. Because the, the buckwheat's a sizer. Okay. It's a blend. Yeah, that I knew. All right. Mm-hmm. And then the straight apple. So, Well, I have actually completed extensive research to find that there are absolutely no references to mead in any Pi- Monty Python movies or skits. So it's a, it's a grand oversight as far as I'm concerned. Although I would not preclude that many Monty Python skits were not written under the exact influence of mead, beer, or recreational drugs. <laughs> uh, in fact, <clears throat> I would suggest that uh, the plight of all British comedy is actually due to the lack of mead consumption. That is very Definitely. true. Yeah. Definitely. Yes, and we are banned once again from all of England. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> I'm banned from my home country. <laughs> this is going to be horrible. So, uh, the Mazer Cup is the largest mead festival in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, uh, it's very interesting uh, because the proximity to Boulder is uh, Denver, and they're right next to each other. And the Great American Beer Festival Ooh. is there in uh, in uh, Denver as well. 
So, um, I'm curious if you guys, either one of you, have been to the Mazer Cup. I'm going. You're going? I would love to go. Okay. I have not been yet myself. So. As long as I can drink it out of a sheep's horn. Well, hopefully uh, none, none of the sponsors for those shows will uh, will listen to this episode, and we have a fighting chance of actually going, because otherwise they'll just greet us at the door and they'll go, bam, once again. I- I'm sorry, fellas, you just can't come in, because you, you have compared mead with stripper pole music, so... <laughs> um, Enjoying mead as a fresh draft is practically non-existent. Um, the crazy liquor laws in the U.S. actually complicate the distribution of mead even further, as some states classified as wine, some classified as beer, and then there's the ABV of various products that splits the classification even further. Um, the resurgence of mead in the U.S. is largely credited to Redstone and David Myers, um, who works there at Redstone as well. We heard from some listeners about Tria Tap Room in Philadelphia and all about their Mead Stravaganza, uh, which was uh, an event they had in the fall. Um, just really great stuff, but it's still quite a confusing landscape, you know, for all of these you know mead letters to actually enjoy, you know, these products. I'm really curious how you guys navigate all this consumer confusion. It's difficult. Uh, you mentioned Redstone. That's the only mead that I personally have been able to have on draft. Um, we have a local pub uh, started up a little over a year ago now, and he has made it a point to bring in interesting ciders, meads, uh, bottles, and uh, finally he was able to get some Redstone mead on draft. Hmm. So that's a nice uh, nice little uh, uh, benefit, I guess you say, having a, having a proprietor of a pub that uh, has an interest in those products, not just turning the beer over. Well, he's paying attention to his uh, his basic consumers and not necessarily his you know distributor that's just trying to pimp stuff that you know they want to sell too. So. Definitely, definitely. And you know, beyond that, uh, most of my meat comes from travel. When I'm able to travel outside of my local area and find things that are distributed in other states that I can't get at home, so uh, that's. Uh, uh, if I see it, I'm going to grab it and I'm going to try it. It uh, some of it's great, some of it's uh, eh, a little less than stellar, but uh, mm. but uh, try as much as I can to, to sample different products from different regions. Mm. So, how do you find prior Shea? How do you find uh, mead when you're on the road? Well, uh, actually, the most people that I actually look for is bee nectar. Uh, really, the one of the ones that got me into bee meads and ciders was bee nectar. Uh, all their stuff is is phenomenal, and uh, it's really a shame with the the laws of states distributions. There's not a lot of people who uh, you know necessarily want to sign them as you know a company that are carrying. But you know, meads have had a re- reinsurgent with people who are celiac, people who are gluten free, and uh, you know these are beverages that someone who is celiac or someone who is uh, you know gluten-free or a lifestyle choice even though the sugar content is higher but uh more of a health health perspective it's really really good as for me as somebody who loves ciders and uh you know loves like stuff like Aton de pont uh bee nectars the uh zombie killer from bee nectar you know they're doing just great stuff and i hope hope one day that you know bee nectar could come to a, a market like this and hopefully help us out Hmm. well i think uh you know part of it is uh what's uh, always presenting a very confusing landscape for consumers is uh such variety even in products that are currently available uh i mean if you and i think about the average landscape for beer or wine 10 years ago it's just exploded exponentially um you know i it's not unusual to go to a casual dining place and for them to hand me a wine list now where, you know, maybe 10 years ago, they'd have like four or five wines and that's it, you know, <clears throat> and you wouldn't even know what they were. They just pour it, <laughs> you know, would you like a grass of red? Okay. Um, but, you know, I think the uh, part of what is uh, going to enable, I think, me to be present, you know, and more available either in directly in a store or even, you know, within a bar or a restaurant is I think just the an educated consumer base and demand. Uh, much like, you know, what you're saying, Jason, which is, you know, the 
the guy that ran this you know pub said oh i have a group of people that would actually enjoy meat if i put it on so Mm -hmm. so there's one thing uh, i'm curious about with with meat in terms of is there really uh is there a major difference in having it fresh on draft versus in a bottle does co2 taint it um you know, because I, I can't imagine. I know the wines that I've had that are pressurized with CO two. I just can't stand it. It just absolutely drives me nuts. You know, I don't know that it taints it. That may not be the the word I would use. It definitely changes it. Um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, of course, you can naturally carbonate uh, any you know, meads as well, and, and that's it just it does a just changes the beverage and your experience of the beverage quite a bit to uh, the way it, it, it lifts off the tongue and yeah. the way it washes in the mouth. You know, it's, it's, it's like anything, the, the higher the level of carbonation, the, the, the more it's going to change. Um, but, uh, I don't know that it taints it. It's, it, I think you have to maybe design or style the, the product to be in that, in that keg or, or on draft. Um, you don't want a, uh, high alcohol, sack strength, uh, mead with a great deal of complexity. Maybe it was barrel aged and and something that you're. I, I wouldn't want that on draft. Now, if you give me a relatively low alcohol for a mead uh, with uh, with you know, let's say it's a berry, a blackberry or blueberry or something of that nature, a lighter, fruitier uh, mead. That uh, you crank up the carbonation on and, and serve it on draft. That's a, that's a fun experience. That's, huh. you know, so you, I think you do need to design or style that product to to <clears> that <throat> to that serving method, if you will. Yeah, and I would say that uh, you know as you go out and you start looking for meads, I would say probably the first one you're going to run into is a Redstone. Um, easily, the Blue Bottle um, is what you're going to find is uh, so widely distributed and available. But um, I agree that, uh, you know, the bee nectar uh, products are definitely um, uh, enjoying some water distribution as well. So, Mm -hmm. well, I enjoyed our uh, quick background on uh, Mead and Mead 101. We are going to take a quick break here, and we will be right back. Hey, thanks for coming back to Sips, Suds, and Smokes. Today we're having a show. Oh, wrong, wrong music, Miguel. Yes, today it is Masterpiece Mead Theater as we discuss Mead 101 and all things Mead. We have uh, three products that we're talking about, and we're about to get to three of these, uh, all three of these products from Bee Nectar. So let's get right to it. Up first is going to be. Anasazi is uh, the first mead that we're going to have. So what I'll do is I'll introduce this and we'll go around and we'll share our tasting notes as well as our suds ratings for each of these as well. Again, all of these meads are from Bee Nectar, which is out of Ferndale, Michigan. Now, uh, uh, Shay and I are going to talk a little bit about distribution for Bee Nectar because uh, it does take a little bit. Uh, let me share uh, with you about the uh, product here first this is uh has an abv of 14 percent um the simple description of this is a barrel aged buckwheat mead now um say we were talking about distribution you know for uh bee nectar and it's uh i only think of finding bee nectar in about three states but you've said that they've been able to hit a bit broader distribution as well well they Everything that they have, uh, they ship it from Michigan to uh, what's a place called Remarkable Liquids out of New York, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Brooklyn or New Jersey, we do which one. But I know that because I get several products out of Remarkable Liquids, and uh, I know that their distribution on their ciders like, uh, you know, the Zombie Killer and the... Uh, there are a few others like that that they get high distribution. Now, like the stuff that we're tasting today, it doesn't see a whole lot of really great distribution. Um, but uh, hopefully, hopefully that our state itself, um, Tennessee, can uh, start getting past their laws and distribution laws and 
taxes and stuff like that because that in itself hinders so many, so many breweries, meaderies, mm-hmm. wineries, everybody from coming into this state and, you know, the taxes and distribution. So hopefully soon we'll we'll see a resurgence of meaderies and people who actually care about coming to Tennessee because it's a it's a it's a merging market. I mean there's a lot of products coming in. There's a lot of stuff that's de- coming down the pipeline. So hopefully that uh, one day we can see bean nectar on the shelf. Well, I know that uh, <clears throat> when I was looking around for uh, sourcing, you know, these products, um, and um, I purchased an awful lot of wine, you know, direct as well as mail order. And, uh, you know, that was one of, the th- one of the things that I noticed rather quickly is that you can find a lot of good meads, you know, in mail order. Um, now, Mail order tends to flow with other, if your wine laws permit direct shipment, um, and meat has been classified as wine, then they flow with, you know, basically the rules around that. And the same thing is true for beer as well. And then there are some goofy states that it's based on the ABV, you know, as to whether you can do mail order. So um, I would not uh, certainly, I would say that you would probably be able to find you know mead mail order in some category either beer or wine in uh, quite a few states I, I would say somewhere around 38 if i had to guess um so <clears throat> there's still just some states that they just don't like mail order period you know and have just not uh, progressively changed a lot of their direct shipment laws you know so but uh, maybe they'll come around well um let's definitely talk about this is uh this particular product um shay why don't you uh Tell us what your tasting notes are and your set rating on Anasazi. Uh, it's slightly fruited, uh, more of a sautern or a botrytis kind of feel to it. Uh, very dessert style. Very uh, Def Leppard poured some sugar on me. <laughs> For sure. Uh, overall, I mean, I, I'd say in the three, three and a half on the suds. Oh, you just... Made the golden rule problem. Uh, no halves. No halfsies. No halfsies. No yeah, halfsies. no halfsies. Man. Yeah. Hashtag no halfsies. Yes, that's correct. So you're going to go with three. I'll go three. All right. Final it- answer. <laughs> Final answer. Ah, oh, what a relief! Thank God we got that one out of the way. Uh, Monk Jason, what do you think about Anasazi from Bee Nectar here? This was actually my favorite of the three, I believe. Hmm. Um, got quite a bit. Of, there was a little bit of a warming sensation, almost a tingling on the tongue. Uh, at first, uh, some of that is tannins. I definitely got a, an oak forward character out of this out of this product. Um, definitely got that nice sweet honey, um, almost uh, whiskey or bourbon on the nose as well. Uh, thought it was well rounded. I enjoyed it a great deal. I think my suds rating on this one's going to be a four. A four? Yeah. Uh, about that, uh, a body should really not make that sound. Um, so bee nectar on Asazi, uh, my tasting notes for this, uh, so this will be interesting today. So I'll, I'll confess to our listeners that I've probably tasted a whopping 15 meads before today. <laughs> so I am definitely the novice at the room. Although my, uh, super nose and super palate, you know, can certainly enjoy a broad range of products. Um, but, uh, I would certainly say the, you know, the background in tasting wines, I really you know, think uh, is really kind of helping me get through a lot of this. So I'm apologizing in advance if my tasting notes sound like a moron. <laughs> so and they not they don't sound like tasting mead. I'm just telling you what I'm tasting. Um, and it's very simple for this one. I you know I thought there was a lot of heavy alcohol on this particular one. Um, it was rather thick, also you know on the tongue as well. Almost kind of a coating, uh, cloying you know type of. Uh, uh, you know, the way that it was playing on my tongue. A little bit of vanilla on this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think uh, the one thing I thought was strange was barrel-aged. I don't know. I just, uh, there wasn't really a tremendous amount of wood on this. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, there were some there. But if you had told me that this was barrel-aged and I was tasting it blind, I probably wouldn't have believed you. So it just uh, doesn't have what I think of with at least some presence of french oak or i I don't know what they age you know uh meads in but i would think it would probably be american oak Uh, 
I've seen uh, a number of different products uh, from used bourbon and whiskey barrels to to brandy and sherry barrels, things of that nature. So I think uh, they're doing a lot, of, a lot of like the uh, the the brewers, the the beer makers are doing uh, with barrel programs. They're they're trying lots of different barrel products or you know different barrel sources, I guess, to to age their their meads in. Hmm. I think the, the most regular would be probably American or most accessible here in the States. Hmm. That or like Slo- Slo- Slovakian oak huh. is a neutral, more of a neutral characteristic when it comes to oak. Yeah. Uh, but I can get the, where you're talking about vanilla. Yeah, a the, little bit. The, yeah, the vanilla is uh, in in the wine world, when you taste vanilla like you would in like a, a really oaky or buttery Chardonnay. Correct, right. That would be your essence of oak or a malolactic fermentation without actually the presence of oak. So, yeah. um, but no, I totally get that vanilla characteristic, like vanilla bean, Tahitian vanilla bean would probably be the best thing I could say to yeah, it. Yeah, it's dead on uh, for sure. Well, my suds rating for B Nectar uh, Anasazi is going to be three. <laughs> Uh, what a relief, as most people are saying that same thing. Oh, my God, he knows nothing about mead. Please, <laughs> where's the fast-forward button? Honestly, uh, mead is, I think, more akin to wine than it is to beer. So yeah. uh, so that background in wine is probably actually more helpful uh, with, with the meads than you would think. So uh, I think one of the uh, questions that I had around the concept of barrel aging with meads is, um, so I know that we talked about one of these had a uh, – very close to sherry. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, that was the one thing that really caught my attention. But, um, which, you know, to me, it, that's a fortified, you know, fermented product. Um, any crossover with dropping mead, like in a bourbon barrel or, uh, you know, in a uh, gin barrel or any, any other fortified wood, you know, barrel aging like that? None that I've heard of, but I don't. I don't personally brew it. I just drink. How about it that? I've actually I've, I've invented an entire new product today. <laughs> a gin barrel would be very, very interesting, especially with a juniper kind of accents to it. So I, I think that would be actually really cool. Clove juniper. We'll call it uh, Paul Tom's Mead. <laughs> oh, Tom's Mead. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of my favorite meads actually do have uh, those, those some of those different, uh, slightly unusual spicing uh, methods. That a lavender mead that was outstanding, uh, chamomile uh, using like a tea product, that, uh, chamomile tea. Um, heather, I've, I've, I think, is a one oh, yeah. that's fairly common. I, I, would, I would imagine so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've had a saison with heather in it. It's really, really nice. Actually. Yes, heather and lavender. Uh, we uh, we actually covered a heather ale uh, on uh, the show. Uh, it is uh, starts with an F. Uh, oh my goodness! Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Frausch, that's it. Yeah, it's a heather ale. Um, so, and I'm still have no idea what heather actually tastes or smells like even after that day because we had like four or five, and I was like, I like that one. So that's one we talked about. So. Well, uh, we've covered uh, one product here from uh, Bee Nectar, and up next is going to be Bee Nectar's Apple Pie, and it has an ABV of 12%, and here is a little bit about this particular mead. The holidays are over, but it doesn't mean you still can't enjoy some delicious pie. Ours is made from fresh apple cider, honey, and pie spices. Perfect after dinner, and it's a sipper for sure. So, uh, Prior Shea, what did you think of pie? This, uh, oh, we're on pie. I thought we were on uh, the buckwheat. We're oh, on pie. No, we're on pie. Uh, <laughs> look at you. It's more of a, a clove Chinese five spice kind of thing. That's my, uh, that's my chef coming out in me in there. Hmm. Uh, high finish, long, uh, high, high sugar, long, long finish. It's one of those meads that will sit with you. Uh, and when I first tried it, you know, uh, I know you and I were talking in the kitchen. I could still taste it, you know, a few minutes after, you know, it went away. And this this is my favorite of all of them. Hmm. The pie is single-handedly. It's, uh, I would give mine on a five scale. It's really good. A five? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, 
Listen to Hang Time. Give me another. Monk Jason, what did you think of Apple Pie from B. Necker? Well, I'm going to swing the other way. This was my least favorite of the three. Wow. Okay, um, here we go. Yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, they they hit the descriptor on the nose. It is uh, an apple pie-flavored uh, mead. Uh, I've become pretty well known for making a apple pie cider. And uh, I've, I've had uh, a lot of iterations of that to try to tame the spices. And in this particular mead, I just thought the spices just barely went over that, that line to a slight harshness. Um, there was definitely that light, crisp apple um, to it. You definitely get the cinnamon in the nose. Um, I, just, I just thought maybe the balance of the spice went slightly harsh. Uh, I did like the way that the apple and the honey lingered on the tongue. It, it, it washes over initially almost a little thin. But then it just stays around, and it's it's pleasant. the The apple and the honey characters are definitely pleasant on the tongue. But I believe the spices may have just went uh, a little over a little over the top on harshness to me. And it's possibly mm. it's possibly the, the the tinge of clove you mentioned. I'm not a clove fan. Me uh, there's a little nutmeg in there, which uh, it tends to have a little uh, harshness as well, especially if you heat it. Uh, that's one thing I've done with mine is not heat my spices when I make the product, uh, so I don't extract any any harshness from yeah, them. Yeah, the so. oils themselves can really uh, take on a bittering characteristic sometimes definitely, with uh, some with some uh, spices. Yeah. So with that in mind, it's still a good product. I still enjoyed it, uh, even though it was my least favorite. So I'm going three on this one. A three. Ah, what a relief. So uh, B neck or apple pie for me. Um, my tasting notes are. It was very floral. Um, it was very light. Um, uh, probably from of the three we have uh, here today, I enjoyed smelling this one. I, I my nose could hang out in that glass for days, and I could smell it when I poured it. It really just had a very pleasant aroma, um, and that was the first thing that caught my attention was just um, how floral it really was. It was light. Um, I thought it had a sweet tart and excellent balance, you know, between the two. Um, I mean, I, uh, I had my cider, you know, brain on, you know, when I was, uh, you know, tasting this, just waiting for that Granny Smith, you know, tartness to basically come up and, you know, greet your tongue. But this really had just a very nice, smooth balance to it. It was my favorite of the, of the, the flight today as well. My sedge rating for bee nectar apple pie is a four. Uh, 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 a body should really not make that sound. I'd say the next time we need to bring some apple pie moonshine, just, just to compare the two. Well, it would definitely make for a more entertaining show, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say again? <laughs> I got a cousin that makes one, I'm just hit, saying. Hit Where'd that, I put my pants? Hit that button. <laughs> oh, I like the sound of that. <laughs> Got a pretty mouth there, boy. <laughs> we are officially banned in Kentucky now. Absolutely. Here we go. Banned once again. Uh, we, uh, we've hit two states and uh, let just uh, 40 minutes go by. So, Well, uh, we've covered uh, two of our products for today. We're going to take a, another quick break here, and we will be right back with our last product as well as some more discussion on meads as well. Sips, Suds, and Smokes today on Masterpiece Mead Theatre as we're talking about all things mead and really bad fake British accents once again. Please don't tune us out right away. We're talking about three products today from Bee Nectar, and we've gone through two of them so far, and we have one more to cover, which is Bee Nectar Buckwheat Sizer. This product is uh, has an ABV of, is that say, 15%. And uh, a simple description on this, this is a still mead made with apple cider and buckwheat honey. Um, So, you know, I am definitely a honey aficionado. (laughs) Um, And, uh, I, you know, I've had buckwheat, you know, honey maybe like once. (laughs) 
you know, um, it's just not, you know, uh, you can barely consume it, you know, raw. I mean, it's it, pretty potent it, stuff. It, it just, it really is not something that most people would just eat directly. You usually combine it with something else. And uh, sometimes it's used as a blending honey um, with other things that basically don't have, you know, the same strong, you know, um, characteristics. Buckwheat pancakes. I love buckwheat pancakes. Yeah, but you would not put buckwheat honey on buckwheat and pancakes. I'd be a little bit overdose on that. Uh, yeah, d- most definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, have you, uh, Jason, you ever worked with a, a product? I have. Um, I have not used it straight. Uh, as you said, blending it is the way to go, in my opinion. And uh, I definitely used a much smaller percentage of buckwheat honey in meads before uh, compared to the, the, the main honey component. Um, it, it is, like I said, very potent, very deep, uh, rich flavor. Um, that's probably why this one has such a unique, rich flavor to it, mm. uh, honestly. It, honey is, like like we said earlier, a very, very meat is very similar in, in a lot of ways to, to wine in that, uh, you know, when you make beer, you have multiple ingredients. You've got multiple grains. You can manipulate those grains to, to taste, you know, through toast levels to taste different ways. You can blend hops to get different flavors. Uh, wine is uh, very dependent on the, the harvest, the grape itself. Uh, and sunshine. Yep, sunshine, rain, you name it. The, the, uh, the, the, the year-to-year differences are great. Uh, well, honey and, and mead, the flavor in honey or flavor in mead is you know, what, what do those bees consume to make that honey? Mm. So it's very localized. What are those bees exposed to? Uh, that's why you hear all these you know, clover, orange blossom, uh, tupelo honey, sourwood honey, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there's as much variation in honey as there is in grape, in my opinion, and that's really the, the, where the, the flavor of mead comes from. Mm. Um, and it's for that reason, like I said, the buckwheat. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know that I, I. Maybe now I'll have to experiment with using uh, straight buckwheat honey. Huh. But that would be a. Uh, you know, you usually <laughs> don't find it in volume. It's you don't usually find large large amounts of the buckwheat honey. Small small. Mm servings or small uh, uh, amounts of that when you purchase it so it, it would be a difficult thing to, to get a larger batch going well i know one of the things that's characteristic of michigan is uh there's a tremendous cider industry um there in michigan and um there's almost a cider season i mean you can actually watch tourists that are filing in you know right there at detroit airport and they're going on cider tours you know and um uh, so I, I guess one of the things that I would would love to ask, you know, the bee nectar meadery is, did that have some influence on the location um, that you basically had uh, great access into not only fresh fruit, um, but you also have the ability of having a lot of what I would guess is a lot of honey that uh they use for pollination you know of basically those fruit trees are essential and so you have you know quite a variety of uh honey to work with there in uh, michigan as well do you think that that was anything that may have influenced where they why they are in michigan well i mean with any great product you need great ingredients uh you know and a pile of money yeah and a pile of money <laughs> Uh, it's you know the uh, like we talk about wine you know it uh, has to do with sunshine terroir where it's from it's there's a reason why places like Romani Conti and Burgundy is some of the most expensive landscape in the world I mean you know it's the most expensive wine in the world there in turn is the most expensive landscape we're talking about what's something in the Paul Park of about 1.2 million dollars for Easily. a little less than a quarter acre you got to know um, somebody to know somebody to get yeah. some of that land. And, yeah, you can't even be American or no. outside of Burgundy mm-hmm. to own any of the land in Burgundy. So, no. you know, with uh, creating stuff like bee nectar, people who have uh, thrived and, you know, are in the top uh, echelons of uh, beer advocate meteries, they use the best products that they money can possibly buy. And, and it shows in their products. It shows in bee nectar. It shows in ciders. It shows, you know, uh, Hill Farmstead using some of the best grains, you know. True. Guys, guys who use the best and spend a little bit more money on grains, barrels, 
you know, the end product's going to come out better. People are more willing to spend more money on products that, you know, they put thought, they put, they put the effort. Um, they didn't just speech with agent. Hmm. <laughs> You're welcome, St. Louis. Um, but, Bam. you know. Once again. Absolutely. But, <laughs> but you know, people who, who, who spend the time and the thought process of it, just like it with any chef, uh, they get their seafood fresh. It's there within 24 hours, you know. They'll be known for that product because the products are good. And, you know, coming back to the question, yes, you know, them being in Michigan, they have apples. They have everything they could possibly need to make a great product, and they make a great product. I mean, there's nobody debating that they make a uh, subpar product. Bee Nectar is one of the best meateries and ciders and cideries in the world. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, with that being said, you know, the prices coincide with what you what you get, and it's totally worth with what you get. Mm. I know what this show needs. I gotta have more cowbell, baby. <laughs> Guess what? I got a fever. And the only prescription is more cowbell. <laughs> <laughs> I love Christopher Walken. <laughs> My cowbell is a little slower than his, <laughs> but it still has good flair, you know. True. So Will Ferrell uh, would be proud. Uh, you know, I have always aspired to have good cowbell in my radio show, so, you know. Um, so let's talk about our uh, tasting notes here for uh, Buckwheat Sizer. Uh, Jason, you were uh, kind of going into a little bit of your tasting notes. Um, why don't you finish up uh, any of your tasting notes and your such rating? Uh, on this one... Uh, Again, since we've already covered my favorite and my and my least favorite of the three, this one definitely slots in the middle. Um, hit a cherry actually on the nose, kind of some of that deeper fruit. Uh, enjoyed that. Uh, it's you know the 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 this one had uh, not quite cloying, but a sweeter finish to me. Um, stuck around quite well. I gave this one um, uh, Sud's rating of three. I really wanted to push it up to a four, but I, I was stuck with three on it. All right. Ah, oh, what a relief. And Prior Shea, what did you think of Buckwheat uh, Sizer here? You know, we talk about Buckwheat Pancakes. This is a Buckwheat Pancake, uh, more of a style of a fortified uh, a Madeira or a Sherry. Uh, I mean, this tastes just like a, a, a really dark, rich Sherry. Uh, wine that you would have it'd be definitely dessert style uh you know at 15 percent alcohol you wouldn't imagine that it's something that looks this viscous and this uh well on the palate but man this is uh i'd say on the suds rating before for me huh how about that uh, yeah i don't have any left in my glass but that's a good sign that, but uh definitely has the tasting cup uh challenge for sure yeah well it, but it definitely had legs i uh, mean it, it it hung out on the side of the glass it was yeah, very thick we, and viscous. We should have been tasting these out of like of a sheep's horn or a cow's bladder <laughs> or something to make it more original. It, you needed more cowbell. Yeah, you know, that's what we or needed to taste. Cow bladder, or whatever you want to do. <clears throat> uh, my tasting notes here on Bee Nectar uh, Buck Week Sizer. Uh, you know, I wrote down uh, sticky sweet, um, and uh, uh, you know, I guess the one thing I really loved about your description was. Um, saying that it was very close to uh, I think you said a Sauternes, right? Yeah. Um, and the thing I kind of retorted back was this this could almost pass for some Tawnies, uh, Tawny Ports um, you know, that I've had as well. Um, this would not make a good Tawny Port, and that's the reason why it's a mead instead, but um, it has some of the same, you know, characteristics. Um, it's, I guess the one thing I noticed about this is it has a really bitter finish. It's like a deep bitter finish like on, a burnt on the back orange. end. Yeah, that's that's it. You know, like a big dark rich burnt orange. Yeah, um, this was not my favorite. Uh, you know, of the of the uh, flight, my sedge rating for buckwheat sizer is going to be two. Was that a belch? So uh, you said sticky sweet. You know what goes great with this theme song for sticky sweet? didn't bring enough dollar bills for this show (laughs) making it rain that's the reason why it's a radio show too jason (laughs) 
<laughs> Man, I've heard some of that. I've heard that song so many times. Not too many times, but... So you're saying that you hang out for all of the auditions for the strip club? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. That's what you're confessing I drink to? mead and uh, hang out the strip clubs. There you go. Well... It, whatever it's going to take, you know, so you can enjoy your meat in the right atmosphere. So, yeah. Sticky sweet. I like that. Um, so I'm uh, curious about, you know, kind of this flight that we had here. Uh, was this, I thought, it, personally, I thought it was very broad representation, you know, of what mead can bring to the table. Um, you know, we, we uh, you guys have had a lot more mead than me, and... Was this a, a pretty decent range, you know, a flight? It's beautiful. <laughs> it is a beautiful flight. I mean, those who, those who have access to this stuff, you're you're a very lucky crowd because it is very rare that you can actually go down to your local store or local meadery and be able to buy stuff like this. So when you do get to have it, it is a treat and a half. So uh, for me, man, I can't I can't say enough. I love I love bee nectar and stuff that they do. So, um, I guess one of the things that I always love uh, when we're tasting uh, stuff is tasting cups are like a dead giveaway about exactly what's going on. Because even though we have, you know, usually one to three ounces, you know, when I see that all the tasting cups are dead empty, that tells me a lot about what's going on. So, um, it's it's true in competitions as well, isn't it, Jason? Oh, definitely. Yeah, and, and, and the dump bucket at a competition <laughs> table is a real tell a of giveaway. how well that flight is going. How come when I did the vegetal category, that dump bucket was stuffed? <laughs> you needed you needed like three dump buckets when you're doing uh, the, the the spice, herb, and vegetable category. I know. I have a new I have a new T-shirt. No more pepper beer. <laughs> I'm gonna ban it for sure. All right. <clears throat> Well, I uh, really enjoyed uh, our discussion, both about just you know meat in general today, as well as uh, covering these products. So, uh, I really enjoyed the discussion. Let's wrap up for today. Uh, thanks to all of our listeners here at Sips Sudden Smokes. You can catch all of our episodes online on iTunes, SoundCloud, TuneIn, Stitcher, YouTube, Uncle John's Basement, and Spreaker, our native media host. Our terrestrial radio stations are always expanding and wondering, gee. Where do we get to play Def Leppard and drink meat at the same time? So if you listen, if you'd like to hear this show on your favorite radio station, send them three bottles of bee nectar and send them a note and copy us as well. You can reach us online anytime at info at sips, suds, and smokes. Our daily tasting notes flow out on Twitter every single day. Our handle is at sips, suds, smoke. Our Facebook page is always buzzing with lots of news. Sips, Suds, and Smokes is sponsored by Craft Beer Kings. Craft Beer Kings, the home for all your beer, wine, and mead needs. They are also the home of the Mystery Box. You can reach them at www.craftbeerkings.com. Listen, do us a favor. Take the time to rate this episode if you're listening to us online. That's a big help to us. Please do not rate my fake British accent. Um, we uh, love to see your feedback, uh, no matter how you send it to us. I want to thank my co-host for being here today. Prior Shea, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It's great. I love the mead. <laughs> We're going to give that a lame mm. sign-off. So. <laughs> yeah. Monk Jason, thank you for being here. Well, thank you. And I want to remind everyone to taste something tasty today. Oh, I like that. That works. See? He set the bar high there for you. <laughs> I just need more cowbell or stripper music. That's there you all I go. Need. <laughs> that's, that's what you needed for sure. I'll try it with Mike. This is Go To Boy Mike asking you to join us once again and keep on sipping. been a one tan hand production of sip suds and smokes a program devoted to the appreciation of some of the finer slices of life from the dude in the basement studios your host the good old boys will see you all next time